What's left when it comes to tickets? Well, if you want to see an event, are you too late? Probably not, according to news specialist Debbie Dijanovic. I was looking for tickets to the four-man bobsled. They wanted more than I was ready to pay. Thinking of hitting the streets to buy Olympic tickets? The tickets were about three times what the, uh, what the face value was. With the week left, what is left? We ended up here at the Salt Lake City run resale swap called the Ticket Exchange at 175 South Main. I think it's a, a way to allow people to feel confident that they can get tickets and trust what they're getting. This is through the city of Salt Lake. Once inside the Ticket Exchange, you'll find a row of resale ticket brokers, every one city licensed with a background check. Ticket seekers line up every day to bargain with the brokers. As long as you make them stick to their price, you can get a good deal. Most events still have open seats, and apparently there are good ticket deals out there. Sometimes even the day of, when there's not too much demand, it goes below face value. With seven days left in Olympic competition, tickets are going for as little as $20. But the more popular events will cost you a lot more than that. 20 bucks has landed some spectators at ski competitions in Park City. Buyers are paying more than face value, though, for figure skating events and hockey tickets. Some as high as $1,000 a piece. The true fan seems willing to pay. Oh, really psyched up. Really psyched up. USA. The city set up the ticket exchange to keep tabs on the brokers and make one-stop ticket shopping possible. But it's up to you to cut your own Olympic ticket deal. Debbie Dujanovic, Eyewitness to the Games. There are other ways to check out the price of tickets and what's available. You can log on to saltlake2002.com or try Smith Ticks. They also have tickets. Hosting the Winter Games can be a lot of pressure for Mark, especially oh, when you've got these weather. kind of snowstorms expected. Yeah. The snowstorms never quite materialized to anything big enough to hurt the events. This afternoon, radar does show snow showers around. Some of the biggest totals of snow have come in from the Cottonwood Canyons. Little and Big Cottonwood Canyon report two or three, four inches of snow. And then to the south, southern Utah mountains picked up seven. But in the last hour, the activity has decreased across the Salt Lake Valley. Let's take our cameras and we'll look outside and see if it looks threatening. Uh, there have been snow showers over the mountains, and it's very hazy looking. Part of that's just the haze we've been having. Part of it is because there are some snow showers in the air. A little bit of snow went across parts of Davis County with maybe a quarter of an inch, enough to leave tire track marks. Temperatures today, before this came in, the temperature actually reached 40 degrees. Now. The forecast still talks about some snow, and we'll have a forecast for the venues if you're traveling out there tomorrow. See you in a few minutes. Right. Thanks, Mark. The Winter Games bring many side effects to a community. Just ahead, we'll look at the connection to crime. Scoring. I'm Carol Makita. I'll have details next. Are and the medals count. Germany leads with 24, United States at 18, Norway 14, Austria 13, Russia 11. This on game day 11. That instead of starting with six points and deducting from that like 5.8 or 5.4, the new system would be just the opposite. We have a system where we add the points to the elements performed on the ice by the skaters. Example, if a double axel is a, in, in the scale of the value is two points, a triple axel is three points. Now, the second change in the number of judges and how they cast their votes. Under the new plan, there would be 14 judges, not nine, and they would all cast their votes secretly by computer. Only seven votes would count, which Mr. Cinquanta says would eliminate the idea of block voting which is what the controversy in the Paris figure skating competition was all about. Now for the latest on that. The French judge who was suspended for misconduct was quoted, quoted in a French newspaper today denying that she was pressured by her federation to vote a certain way. She wants the ISU Council to hear her testimony again. Mr. Ginquanta says he has her written testimony. That's why she was suspended. But the 11-member council may hear from her at a later date. Dickandini, the investigation and the controversy continue. All right, Carol, Carol. more, thanks. Gold medalist Luan Gardner is still in the hospital today. We'll have an update on his recovery from frostbite and how you can send him your get well wishes just ahead.
today on Eyewitness News at 5. Can Eric Burgess become the first to win back-to-back -back gold in the freestyle aerials? It's harder to repeat than it is to win the first time. Hear what he thinks about the pressure in an exclusive interview. Also, is there life on Mars? Scientists get a chance to find proof. And the man who trashed Salt Lake in the Olympics gets his just desserts. We brought him 10,000 boxes of jello. Olympic coverage continues today on the KSL 5 Eyewitness. On up, pickpocketing and purse snatching. There are 113 more cases this month compared to the same period last year. You can review the crime statistics on our webpage at KSL.com. The Houston, Texas woman accused of drowning her five children is facing a jury today deciding her fate for capital murder. 37-year-old Andrea Yates has a history of mental illness, and her attorneys claim that kept her from knowing right from wrong when she drowned each of her five children last summer in their bathtub. Prosecutor Joe Ombi told jurors Yates is presumed innocent until proven guilty. CBS News, as one of Edward R. Murrow's boys, went on to become chief anchor and analyst for ABC News. He died Friday at his home near Washington. His son Jack says his dad died of pneumonia, aggravated by congestive heart failure. He was 87. Smith had a stellar career that included moderator of the first Kennedy-Nixon presidential debate in 1960, a landmark TV event generally thought to have played a decisive role in Kennedy's election. Today is President's Day, a holiday for many of us. It falls halfway between the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. Our country's first president, George Washington, was honored today in Mount Vernon, Virginia, at his former estate. The service included a wreath-laying ceremony, patriotic music, and military performances. Washington died in 1799 at Mount Vernon, and the mansion is now a museum. Rulon Gardner is currently recovering from a snowmobiling incident last week in the Bridger Teton National Forest. This picture was taken yesterday of Rulon at Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center in Idaho Falls. He's there surrounded by family and friends. Officials say his condition is fair. He's looking forward to a speedy recovery. And if you'd like to check on Rulon's daily condition or even to send him an email and wish him well, well, you can go on our website at ksl.com. Now, let's get back with Mark for just a minute, who's been tracking those snowstorms. Sometimes yeah. that can be a little bit tricky, can it, Mark? Huh? It, it can be. Uh, let's look at it on the satellite picture. There was a storm that came into the west, but it went to the southern part of the state. See this little circulation right here going around and around? Well, that dumped seven or eight inches of snow in the mountains of southern Utah. And then there's this little line here that went across the north. It brought some snow to the Cottonwood Canyons, but in the valleys, it was mostly a trace or a quarter of an inch and kind of dinky. Here's the big low pressure. You would think that would have stirred up more than it did. Then we have a big high pressure sitting over the eastern part of the country. Well, with a dip here and a rise here, let's check the temperatures. Right now, across the United States, 48 Chicago, 57 around Kansas City. Uh, coolish 66. That's cool for New Orleans. 36 in Salt Lake City. That's better than we've been having. Great Falls, a little Chinook wind at 45. So... It's a fairly pleasant day, kind of cold in the upper part of New England. Let's say tomorrow you're headed to Deer Valley for the aerials in the afternoon. 32 Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, partly cloudy. Light winds, should be a good day. Or if you're going to go across country at Soldier Hollow, 37 tomorrow and partly cloudy. Boy, it's amazing how nice these outdoor venues have been. This is normally a very stormy time of the year, but we've gotten by without much going on. Here's a kind of a close-up picture of that low coming through. And out here, here's kind of the end of the thing. Still some clouds, and then a great big bunch of clouds out here. Wouldn't that be a threat? Well, it depends on the steering motions. Right now, 36 in Salt Lake City. Boise's 51, Seattle 50. It's really kind of warm all around us. Within Utah, it's still cold in Cache Valley, but really nice. St. George, that's unusually cool for St. George. Well, let's watch that cloud system for tomorrow that's coming on shore. Big jet stream flow. You can just see the clouds racing across here. This is pretty ominous looking. This ought to be forced into the interior of Utah. But watch the jet stream. Here it is now along near San Francisco. Let's check it out for tomorrow. By tomorrow morning, it's coming into Utah, and here comes the clouds and moisture. But by evening, boink, it moves to the north, and all that action should roll across Idaho and miss us. Or at least there'll be clouds around, but it looks like it'll be pretty dry. As far as the venues go, tomorrow, low 40s, partly cloudy, and up in the higher elevations, if you're going to the Olympic Park or Deer Valley, Soldier Hollow, 30s, 1 Celsius, 
looks really nice. And looking down the road, St. George, you warm back up and you stay spring-like. Wasatch Front. Tomorrow looks okay, but there's a threat of snow. It doesn't look like a big deal, but there's a threat of snow on Wednesday. And look at that. That's the warmest of the entire month of February so far. I don't know about you guys, but I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Friday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wednesday, not, not bad either if there's a little nice storm. All right. We found some of the longest lines around during the Olympics. And we're not talking about lines for venues. No, no, no. Pavilions of porta potties are all around, but you probably didn't realize just how many people it takes to make sure everything is working properly when nature comes calling. <laughs> Johnny Biscuit joins us live to explain. Johnny, you're all right, I trust. Yes, I am. You know, as you enjoy your Olympic experience, there's one detail you might have overlooked: the Olympic porta potty. Now, without the Olympic porta potty, all the athletic competition, the cultural exchange, even Utah's natural beauty would become meaningless in just a few short hours. And this porta potty effort has involved hundreds of workers. Assembled from Washington, Utah, Nevada, and other states around the region, professional porta potty workers toil to keep the facilities clean, serviced, and available. A majority of the servicing occurs during the hours of the frigid night. Just like any project this size, there's a great deal of planning and coordination. This planning and coordination takes place in the porta potty war room. Consider this. this. What follows is a tribute to the unsung heroes of the Olympic Games. The people without whom all the preparation and competition, the beauty of Utah's natural landscape, all would become meaningless in just a few short hours. Yeah, that's right. Working through the night to maintain these facilities for everyone to be able to enjoy themselves during the games. Now, I found these workers to work with pride and professionalism, to care about what they do and to care about the visitors' experience to the Olympics. So next time you're out there and you're visiting one of the facilities, I think you should maybe take a moment to consider all the hard work that's behind your happiness and maybe give a thank you to the professional porta potty workers. Reporting live, I'm Johnny Biscuit. <laughs> that really is a dirty job. It, Somebody someone, has to do it. And now. we're glad they do. <laughs> okay, By the Johnny way, you can see more on porta potties tonight on SLC Live at 1130. All right. Just ahead on Olympic perspective uh, from the cat in the hat, kind of. <laughs> You'll understand when you hear it. Trust us. I'm Jed Bowl, live in Park City. There's a lot of huge air at Utah Olympic Park. We'll show you some that's off the competition hill coming up. And where's Al? If you want to be on the Today Show, he's going to be at the Western Experience area at Soldier Hollow, 5 to 8 a.m. So you've got a little bigger window here for those of you who aren't early birds to try and make it. We'll be right back. Medals could be on the horizon, but first a story of some concern. U.S. speed skater Apollo Antonono is named in threatening emails that have been turned over to the FBI. Ono won the gold medal in the 1500 meter race last night, but only after race officials disqualified the South Korean skater. A flood of threatening emails came in after Ono's first race in which he won the silver medal. And U.S. Olympic officials say since last night, another 16,000 emails came in, most of them apparently from South Korea. So many emails that they crashed the USOC's computer server. As the FBI investigates the threat, South Korea's Olympic Committee has filed a formal complaint over the officiating at last night's event. Eight games against the U.S. in the pre-Olympic tour, but the U.S. women know they cannot get complacent. Canada won the last seven world championships. The U.S., of course, won Olympic gold at Nagano. So there's a lot of weight on both teams coming into this game. Now, the last time the two teams squared off here at the East Center was in October. The U.S. took that game four goals to one, then went on to an undefeated season that brings them here tonight. So they feel it, they know this is the game. It's crazy that the whole tournament comes down to this game, you know, and, and you have to perform at your best um, when the time comes. We've been preparing for so long, you know. Um, we had, uh, you know, a great season last year, but we didn't finish off in the finals and Canada beat us in the finals. So um, this year we've, we've been preparing and, and, and mentally we're there, physically there, and, and I think we're ready. 
You know, this U.S. team has talked a lot about wanting to win at home right here in front of family and friends. And in about an hour or so, they'll have a chance to make that happen. We're counting on it. Thanks, Sammy Linebar. I mentioned Bodie Miller, the U.S. skier who won a silver medal today. It's his second silver medal in the giant slalom. Olympic special Shelly Ostrello was there, and she joins us now live from Park City. Shelly, Bodie was going for the gold. Is he disappointed with the silver? Well, I asked he wasn't disappointed you know he was in seventh place after the end of the first run and in giant slalom they combined the times from both runs so he knew he really had to make up time and just as he did in the combined he really pushed it and he managed to make up that time to win the silver medal it's really fun to watch Bodie ski especially when he's pushing that hard it's almost reckless but if he makes it to the finish he does well Four. Three. Beneath his calm exterior, Bodie Miller's skiing style is explosive, literally attacking the course and its gait. Even his teammates admire that quality. Bodie, as a competitor, is uh, com his competitive spirit. You know, he wants, like he said uh, in his interviews, he wants to give it his all, and he does. Bodie Miller has always been an aggressive skier, but it's been moments of brilliance mixed with crashes. Now he's been consistent in getting through that finish line. Miller began skiing when he was three. He had four World Cup top 10 finishes last season and a couple of podium finishes this December. He's been to one Olympics, 98 in Nagano, where he fell in both the GS and slalom events. That same spirit made him hike up the course and finish his run, to the roaring delight of the crowds. This year, he's looking for a much different finish. And right now, I'm skiing slalom probably faster than anybody in the world, so if I can get to the finish with two clean runs, it, it usually wins. Yeah, that's right. He's talking about slalom. So he does have another shot at a gold medal Saturday when he skis in the slalom. By the way, local favorite Park City's uh, Eric Schlopey had trouble on his first run, kind of slid past a gate, but still finished, you know, wanted to give the hometown crowd a, uh, you know, finish his race in front of them because they were very supportive, and he did come down and finish that first run. So uh, gold, Stefan Eberharder from Austria, silver Bodie Miller, and Lasse Schuss of Norway won the bronze. It's going to be a great wa race to watch on TV tonight. Back to you. Sure will be. Thank you very much, Shelley Ostelo. An incredible medal performance by Team USA so far at these games, Dick and Nadine, and with uh, two full days of competition, the expectation is there are more yet to come. We hope. All right, thanks, Bruce. Well, let's check in on uh, the weather and what a difference a, a day made. Sunny mm. in both places oh, it was. nice, Mark. Yeah, yesterday it was the snow. It didn't really stop the athletes, and it just made it look kind of nice for spectators, but it did snow. It snowed quite hard in the high country. Fourteen inches fell at Utah Olympic Park. They racked up six before the evening was over. That was yesterday. That low pressure has now moved out, and let me show you what has moved in. The sun is out, the mountains glisten, the skies are blue, and as a matter of fact, the temperatures have gone up to 47. But that's nothing. Wait till you see the forecast for tomorrow. That's coming up in just a minute. All right. We don't I need like this fleece my... anymore. <laughs> what he talks. U.S. Olympians are wearing a special reminder of those killed September 11th. New specialist John Daly joins us now live with details. Nick and any U.S. athletes say throughout these games, the heroes of September 11th have inspired them, and each of those athletes has a piece of jewelry that serves as a constant reminder of an individual who died that day. The memory of September 11th has never been far away from these Olympic Games. U.S. athletes carried the Ground Zero flag at opening ceremonies, and many are wearing another reminder. Last night in Park City, a long line of people waited to meet gold medalist Peekaboo Street. As Street signed autographs, she wore a copper bracelet inscribed with a single name, that of a New York City firefighter who died when the towers of the World Trade Center came down. Mine says uh, Chaplain Michael Judge. Judge was the man who rushed to ground zero to deliver last rites to victims of the disaster, only to be killed by falling debris when the second tower fell. It means a lot. It's really like, I don't know, I'm, I'm proud to, to be able to wear it and... That's the closest I could get. I haven't been there yet, and I want to go pay tribute. And it's just, um, this is heroic. On the eve of the Games, all 211 members of the U.S. team received a bracelet through one of the September 11th foundations, each with the name of a New York firefighter killed that day. Gold medalist skeleton athlete Tristan Gale wears a bracelet that honors Squad 1 fireman David Fontana. 
When I first got the bracelet, I was so worried. I'm like, I hope that David would be okay with me having his name on it. I was like, I'm sure. I thought maybe he'd want someone cooler or something, but hey, <laughs> I brought this home, so, and I kept this on my wrist. I didn't slide with it just because I was afraid I might damage something, <laughs> like me or it. <laughs> so I took it off, but it, uh, it's been on my wrist since opening ceremonies, except for that. That's truly inspiring. We should note that not every firefighter who died that day is represented on a bracelet, only the ones whose families gave permission for their name to be inscribed. Many athletes are wearing the bracelets around the Olympic Village and say they will keep them their whole lives. Reporting live from John Daly, Dick and Deanie, back to you. Best idea, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Thanks, John. Perhaps the most compelling competition of the Olympics will take place tonight, and three members of Team USA are poised to win a medal. Carol Makita joins us from inside the Salt Lake Ice Center with a preview of women's figure skating finals. Carol, a lot of media attention on this one tonight. Very much so, Dick and Dee Dee. That's because along with a gold medal come millions of dollars of endorsements, particularly for an American. And for six-time national champion Michelle Kwan, who is also a six-time world medalist, tonight will be an evening of reflection and determination and a chance for her to bring together everything that she's worked so hard for. This will be the moment Michelle Kwan has waited for, for at least four years, some say her entire life. The gold medal eluded her in 1998, but with this long program, she hopes to rise to the occasion and the top of the podium. She doesn't believe having the Olympics in America gives her a competitive advantage, but she says it's certainly a personal plus. My family's here, they're rooting for me, everything is live, um, so they're sitting in front of the tube and just cheering me on. And, uh, you know, it just, it doesn't change what the judges are going to think. One reporter wanted to know how Irina Slutskaya from Russia, who is in second position going into tonight's free skate, is handling all of this American patriotism. I think Americans, they like me, but of course I'm not favored like American girl, <laughs> but I think they don't forget about me. We like you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Michelle and Irina have become friends during all of their competitions and say there is mutual respect. But they well know the gold medal could come down to a couple tenths of a point. No room for errors. And if so, that's where Sasha Cohen comes in. She has proven herself to be quite the competitor in this, her first foray into international competitions. Being here, she says, is a dream come true. So don't count her out of the race for gold. We've all been training very hard and, um, you know, anything can happen. And, you know, I'm just excited to be a part of it. Now, six-time national champion and three-time Olympian Todd Eldridge has announced his retirement from amateur skating. He will skate in the Pro-Am events and we will also hold training seminars for young up-and-coming skaters. So, the ladies' big event this evening, right here on Channel 5. You'll see the finals and the medal ceremony, so stay tuned. Dick and Deanie? Oh, we will. Right. Must see. Okay, thanks, Carol. From Home Depot to the medal stand. Olympic gold medalist Tristan Gale is here next. And just four concerts left here tonight at the Olympics Medals Plaza. We will introduce you to tonight's performer. That's coming up in a live report. And let's look at that old medal count. Doggone it, there's still five behind Germany, but we're working on it. Yep. That's the way it stands as of day 14. Today's Eyewitness to the Games is brought to you by Visa, Samsung, and the Home Depot. If you protect me from secondhand smoke, I'll be less likely to become one of the 300,000 kids to suffer from smoking-related asthma attacks every year. If you protect me from secondhand smoke, I can grow up to be anything I want, like a world-class skier. Or maybe a lawyer.
Shirley, fee fam, my Merle, Shirley. The best part about free checking? I can write as many checks as I want. Lincoln, 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 bo bacon, banana, fanna, bo bacon, fee fam, my Lincoln, Lincoln. No minimum balance and free online banking. Zion, Zion, bo Zion, bo banana, fanna, bo Zion. Chevrolet sponsors the 2002 U.S. Olympic team all year long. And it shows. Hey, good job. All right, just zoom right in on Chevy S. Yeah, oh, that's great. Chevy, day in, day out, we'll be there. The American flag will be going up in the medals plaza again tonight for silver medalist Bodie Miller. And after that, Alanis Morissette will take the stage. Oh, our style and Stacey Butler is in the medals plaza right now. They're getting ready, I guess, usually at this time of day. Yeah, Deanie and Dick, uh, Alanis Morissette just finished her sound check here at the Olympics medals plaza. And hard to believe, but after tonight, there are only three official Olympic performances left in this lineup that we've enjoyed so much. Now, Alanis Morissette appeared this morning on the Today Show bright and early where she told Matt Lauer that tonight's performance is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be involved in the Olympics and it's perfect timing to kick off her third and latest album, Under Rug Swept. It features her new hit single, Hands Clean. Tonight's performance that begins about a quarter to nine. She heads north to her native Ottawa and then goes on a five day tour through Canada. Her new album hits the stands next week. Now, only three concerts left. Tomorrow night, it's the Goo Goo Dolls and then NSYNC, and then it ends with Martina McBride. Hard to believe that it's almost over. Boy, have we enjoyed this being in our backyard. Hope that you can make it out some point, even if it's just to stand outside and listen. Back to you. Boy, yes, it has been fun. Oh. And I'm wondering, Stace, now that the week is getting, it's getting closer to the end, are people coming out in big crowds? What are the crowds like down there? You know, they're as busy, it seems to me, as the last two days, Deanie, um, which is surprising considering it's a school day, a school night. And I think that people really are wanting to come out here and get a taste of what it's like. And it's very exciting. All right, thanks. Look out for the procrastinators. I know. Tomorrow it, night and they'll Saturday. be out in four. Yeah. We'll have today's news headlines next, including the sad news about Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl. That's when Eyewitness to the Games, day 14, continues. Attention users of the drug FenFen. This may be your last chance for a cash award. If you used FenFen, you may have suffered heart damage. Call attorney Keith Barton now. He's helped thousands of people and he can help you too. I'm attorney Keith Barton. Even if you've not yet experienced any side effects, call me now. You may be entitled to your share of a $12 billion settlement. Symptoms can take up to five years to be seen. Users of the drug FenFen call the attorney you know. Call attorney Keith Barton now. You may be entitled to a cash award. One call, that's all. No way you're missing the powder day, even if it means taking a sick day. So don't miss the only chance to get a fully loaded Ranger for just $198 a month with 0% financing. Check out the 4x4 XLT Super Cap with an off-road package, including all-terrain tires, keyless entry, power everything, and a 4.0 liter V6 with automatic transmission. Now until March 2nd, get a new loaded Ranger for only $198 a month. Hey, you don't let the best stuff in life pass you by. Why start now? See your Heart of the West Ford store today. Chickens have breasts, wings, and thighs. 
but no one has ever found the nuggets on a chicken. It's not there either. Introducing chicken breast strips from Carl's Jr. Because chickens don't have nuggets. R.C. Willie holds over our President's Day sale prices through Saturday. Okay, who's going to open the doors? Extending one of the biggest sales of the year with savings store-wide like your choice of several beautiful seven-piece room groups. Sofa, love seat, three tables and two lamps, everything just $9.99. You'll save up to $560 and pay nothing for six months. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, come in for free collectible pins while 200 each day last per store. Saturday, free hot dogs and drinks. President's Weekend is one of the biggest sales of the year at R.C. Willie. Hurry, it all ends Saturday. Hi, you're on KSL. When Utah is ready to talk, Doug Wright is ready to I listen. I just got to comment on what I heard this morning on your show. When issues affect your family, your health, your pocketbook. That's what we're talking about. Doug Wright puts the spotlight on your world. These guys are way out of line. What are they thinking? Go live and local with Doug Wright. What's on your mind this morning? Your choice for at-work listening from 930 until noon. Followed by the news and Sean Hannity on KSL News Radio 1160. The State Department is reporting American journalist Daniel Pearl is dead. The Wall Street Journal reporter was kidnapped a month ago by Islamic extremists in Pakistan. U.S. officials say diplomats have received evidence that Pearl was killed by his captors. Pearl was pursuing a story about the radical Muslim movement and alleged shoe bomber Richard Reed at the time. He is survived by his wife who was seven months pregnant. A U.S. Army helicopter has crashed into the sea off the coast of the Philippines. A Pentagon spokesman says 12 Americans were on board. Search teams are still working, but they've found no survivors. There's no indication the helicopter was brought down by hostile fire. It was flying in tandem with another chopper at the time. A former Catholic priest in Massachusetts who has become the central figure in an expanding sexual abuse scandal in Boston's Catholic community has been sent to prison. John Gagan will spend at least six years behind bars for molesting a 10-year-old boy in the Boston parish he once served. I would like also for him to be removed from civilization where he would never hurt another child. He accepts no responsibility for his heinous and immoral conduct and intends to do nothing about it. Gagan's case is the first of several rocking the Catholic Diocese in Boston. Under a directive from Cardinal Bernard Law, the Archdiocese has turned over the names of 80 priests who have been accused of sexual abuse. Last July, it was disclosed Cardinal Law knew about Gagan's problem in 1984, yet approved his transfer to another parish. Yeah. Meanwhile, another Massachusetts priest has been suspended following allegations of sexual misconduct with a minor. The accusations against that priest uh, date back to 1967. Officials in the state of Georgia say the cost of searching for corpses at a rural crematory are going to be staggering. State officials briefed Governor Roy Barnes today so he can determine whether he's going to ask for federal help from authorities. So far the state spent about five million dollars since efforts began last week to find corpses near the crematory in the town of Noble. Investigators have discovered just over 240 bodies. They're expecting they could find up to 300. The crematory operator is jailed on theft by deception of charges for allegedly accepting payment for cremations that weren't performed. A federal judge in Ohio has revoked the U.S. citizenship of a former factory worker based on allegations he was a Nazi death camp guard during World War II. Officials say there's enough evidence from several different war documents to prove that John Demanyuk guarded Nazi death force labor camps. The now 81-year-old insists he was a prisoner of war. A spokesman for Demyanyuk said they plan to appeal the decision. The 12th and final burn victim from the World Trade Center attacks has been released from the hospital. Donovan Cowan had been working on the 97th floor of the second building when hijackers crashed a jetliner into it. The 34-year-old made it out with severe smoke inhalation and burns Throughout covering 50% of his body. Over the last five months, Cowan has undergone multiple surgeries, skin grafts, and physical therapy. You know, I consider myself lucky that I'm surviving because I, I heard so many of my friends died. Cowan, an accountant, says he wants to work again, but still has several months of recovery ahead of him at a suburban recovery. rehabilitation center. I noticed in our live shot here in Salt Lake that Stacy didn't need a parka on. Not today. The, uh, the flowers wow. are going to start coming up at this rate, Mark. 
It's true. Temperatures in the west are really warm. Look at the clouds across the country. You don't see too many storm areas. Most of the storms have moved off the east coast. Let me overlay the western, let me overlay the map with the upper air chart, the big jet stream flow. The jet stream clear up here north of Seattle, then it takes a little dip down here to Arkansas and back out again. So a little bit of storminess here around the Great Lakes. But when high pressures get this big and this strong, it gets warm. Let me put the current temperatures on. That's not a mistake. That is 88 at Los Angeles. I just checked Disneyland is 91 right now. It's 30 in Chicago, so there's the cooler air. But wow, a western heat wave, at least a southwestern heat wave, is going on right now. As far as locally... 45 in Salt Lake, there are some high, thin clouds approaching. Boise's a comfortable 51. Great Falls, a remarkable 54. And Seattle, also 54. Within Utah, Cache Valley, you're still the cold spot. That, that cold air keeps getting trapped. Until you melt the snow, that's going to keep happening. 40s, 50s, and 60s in St. George, but that'll be short-lived. 70s, coming back tomorrow for St. George. In the Pacific, Hawaii is sitting over here. This is a big flow of air from Hawaii. And then there's some cold air coming down. So this is, this is quite a storm system. But it's being held at bay by our, our western high pressure. This little dip, though, will come flying through on Saturday. It'll cause a real change. But tomorrow, jet stream winds way up here, storminess here, dry here in the morning. By evening, there comes that little dip on the jet stream. But it still looks really, really nice in Utah all day Friday. Tomorrow, Olympic Park, the bobsleigh, 48 degrees. You won't need a park of tomorrow afternoon. Soldier Hollow, the Nordic Combine finishes up, 49 at Soldier Hollow in the afternoon with sunshine. And the outlook for Park City, the slalom, 10 degrees Celsius. Sunny skies, light winds. I'm telling you, it is an outdoor day tomorrow. And for that matter, the next seven days, St. George drops back to the 60s and then just stays there with mostly sunny skies. The Wasatch, here's the change. Tomorrow, we go up to 57, exceptionally warm. We go down to 45 with rain and maybe a little bench snow, snow in the mountains, cold on Sunday, and then it goes back to being normal. So normal will feel pretty good. It will. Ah. <laughs> Thanks. Normal. If you've been following our Olympic coverage, you know we've been following Latvia as our adopted international team. And we've seen that that gesture has created something of an international phenomenon. And it all started with Bruce Lindsay. He joins us now to show us what it's led to. Hey, thanks, Dina. You know, we never imagined the kind of response we'd get to our supportive team, Latvia. Uh, in fact, our Latvian updates have been noted on Latvian television and Latvian newspapers and a Latvian language weekly that's published in Brooklyn and on Latvians online on the Internet. And when Divs Rezniaks of Latvian television in Riga heard about it, he volunteered to create this report for KSL, which explains why Latvians have been so passionate about their Olympic team this year. It's 4 a.m. The streets of Latvia's capital city of Riga are empty. But this is not your regular quiet night. People are getting up and turning in TV sets. Bars and restaurants are packed with people waiting for the action to start. The hockey action. This is the first time Latvian national ice hockey team plays in Olympics since regaining independence from Soviet Union some 10 years ago. For five years, Latvian team has been playing in top group of world championships. And every year, more and more fans follow their hockey team throughout Europe. Some people save up their money all year long just to go to the championships and be as close as possible to the team. For most of Latvians, hockey is not just a game. Call it a hockey fever, a sickness that's taken over almost everyone in Latvia. Opinion polls show that some 70% of country's residents are watching the national team's games. And it's not hard to find an explanation for the madness. Just look at the country's history. For 50 years, Latvia was occupied by the Soviet Union. And this is the chance to show that we are still here and we can be a positive force. We are a small country, but we are tough. We have proven that over the centuries we still exist. 
I have the same feelings that I had 10 years ago when we stood on the barricades and fought for independence. That was fantastic. And I think most people now have the same feelings. During the games, people talk only about hockey. Two years ago, Latvia's parliament even delayed approvement of a new government, thanks to the Latvian-Russian hockey game in World Championships. And yes, Latvian fans are aware of Latvian update on KSL TV. They say they are happy that someone has paid so much attention to such a small nation and promised to cheer for U.S. As far as Americans don't go head to head with Latvian athletes. This is Dean Strezniak, Latvian Television, reporting for KSL TV. Thanks to Dean's KSL's man in Latvia for that report. Well, today the Latvian Olympic update does not offer a lot to cheer about. Latvia's Ivers Siagans did not finish today in the men's giant slalom, but Latvia's hopes are still high for its four-man bobsleigh team tomorrow, Dick and Nadine, so you can keep your fingers crossed and know that they're rooting for us and we're rooting for them and it's Absolutely. been a great a lot a lot of fun it's fun and we keep teasing bruce that there may be a, a diplomat to, or an ambassadorship in your future there at this be. rate you better look up bruce. Okay, thanks. thanks okay very good four o'clock in the morning seems a little early for beer for that kind of thing yeah. not right now anyway <laughs> just ahead find out about the guy who makes sure the ice at the east center is just right I'm John Hollenhorst with the unusual air traffic security restrictions around the Salt Lake Airport. Where are the high rollers going with their corporate jets? We'll have a report. And it's your last chance tomorrow. If you've been trying all this time to get on the Today Show, better go to the canyons from 5 to 8 a.m. If you've taken the diet drug FenFen, call Siegfried and Jensen as soon as possible. FenFen has been linked to a number of medical problems, including lung disease and heart valve damage. The manufacturer of the drug has set aside over $12 billion to pay claims against the drug. But time is running out. Call Siegfried & Jensen right now at 1-800-993-9393. The call is free. The advice is free. Siegfried & Jensen. Call 1-800-993-9393. I know it's going to build us the coolest treehouse. I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. Well, let's see what you got. Oh, wow, a treehouse. He can build anything. Never built anything before. Relax, I think you're in the right spot. He wants a trap door. Balcony. Rope swing. I'm going to suggest 16 feet. You can do it. You sure I can do this? He's a genius. Trust me. All right. of sight. Dramatic new breakthroughs in the treatment of eye diseases. A cure in your lifetime. This message of hope for a generation locked in darkness. You'll see. The Moran Eye Center Campaign for Vision. You'll see. University of Utah Moran Eye Center. I need professional help. It's just not working. Everything's up in the air. I need safety, security, something stable. I need closure. Lady, face it. Your garage door opener's got to go. A phone is all you need to have a LiftMaster professionally installed with the latest safety and security features. Like a hands-free security light. My wife ignores me. And now? My remote ignores me. I, I... The unprecedented uh, air traffic restrictions around this Salt Lake Airport have been... Uh, troublesome at least if not devastating to some businesses the helicopter ski industry is one example but the uh, but it's been a big boon to other aviation interests in out-of-the-way places you never know who's going to be flying into Evanston these days can't tell you who I'm flying it's uh, it's a private jet and that's why they, they use it whether it's a Cessna Citation, a Gulfstream, or a Learjet, the big money planes are coming in for the Olympics. Last weekend, there were 25 jets parked overnight, three nights in a row. I've never seen that here. <laughs> never. 20, not 25 jets. Not, never. Normally, a tanker truck brings in aviation fuel once a month. During the Olympics, it's been once a day. The passengers are business bigwigs, Olympic sponsors, high rollers, and every now and then, a celebrity or two. 
Well, I guess we did have the vice premier of the, the vice premier of Russia through, which I didn't realize that until after she was here. And then uh, Howie Mandel. Pennsylvania businessman Matt DeSoto is already on his second trip to the Salt Lake Olympics. I ended up flying my girlfriend home and then came back with uh, some work associates today. So why is Evanston suddenly the airport of choice for jet-setting Olympic visitors? It's because Evanston is just outside the 45 nautical mile protective limit that security officials drew around Salt Lake City. Private planes that land inside the circle are required to land first at gateway airports in Nevada, Idaho, or Colorado. You have to stop that airport, get searched by the FBI, take all your stuff off, get searched, get back on, and now you're allowed to fly back into Salt Lake City. Once you get in Salt Lake City, you also get searched, and you do the same to leave. In Evanston, National Guardsmen do spot checks, but you and your jet won't be delayed by searches or intermediate stops. Coming to here and you're only 60 miles away, you can drive in, so it's a lot simpler. Some other airports outside the security zone are also busy, busy, busy. That includes the Logan and Wendover, Wendover airports. The airport in Nephi has also been quite busy, but they don't take the corporate jets there, just the light aircraft. Back to you, Dick and Dini. Well, you won't see my private jet at any oh. of no. In fact, you won't see it anywhere. Really? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> hey, thanks, John. Sports specialist Tom Kirkland is going to catch us up on all of today's sports news, including a new story about what American bobsledder Gene Racine was really up to in those days just before the race. That's when I witnessed to the game's day 14. <laughs> Today's Eyewitness to the Games has been brought to you by Visa, Samsung, and the Home Depot. It's not every four years, it's every day. Get inside the U.S. Olympic team with free gold medal pass email updates exclusively at usolympicteam.com.